Hello again, I'm Lauren Diapoli, and this is Module 3, Stages and Processes of Change. In this module, I'm going to be discussing the trans-theoretical model and stages of change construct, the determinants and mediators of change, experiential processes and behavioral processes of change, as well as the theory of planned behavior and the theory of reasoned action. And then I'll quickly discuss the Simons the assignments that you're going to complete after you view this lecture and complete the readings for the module. This is the trans theoretical model and the stages of change construct. This model assumes that individuals move through a process of five stages when they're moving towards a behavior change. This doesn't necessarily mean that we move in one direction through these stages. It's more a dynamic process that occurs based on people's readiness to change and patients go through a variety of social and behavioral processes in order to move towards change. So understanding where patients are in this process and assessing their readiness can really help us to make better informed intervention designs. But the trans theoretical model is not a means of predicting the patient's behavior. It's just a model of change. So this is a nonlinear, gradual, continuous, dynamic process where our patients will move back and forth, recycling through stages. And the trans theoretical model also assumes that there are specific determinants and mediators that will help an individual move through 10 processes of change. Determinants of an individual's behavior and determinants of behavior changes are influences that affect a person's perceptions, their attitudes, feelings, and even environmental conditions. Some other influences are non-modifiable, like a person's socioeconomic standing, a lack of education, inability to obtain more education, or any other outside forces that are beyond the patient's control. This could be something like their home life and influences from social interactions that they encounter, and that can personally affect them. As healthcare professionals, the most effective way to assist an individual in making behavioral changes is to identify the determinants of their current behavior so that we can mediate behavior change. There are two mediators of change according to the trans theoretical model one of which is decisional balance, and this is an important component of the behavior change process. Similar to perceived benefits and perceived uh, barriers in terms of the health belief model, what a decisional balance is really involves the weighing of pros and cons towards making a change. So a patient will determine whether the anticipated benefits of their change will outweigh the costs of following through with the change. An example of a pro to behavior change would be eating healthy foods can reduce my risk of cardiovascular heart disease, but a con might be eating healthier will be more costly. Actively listening to patients, as we've talked about in modules prior, will really help us uh, to understand our patients as they present perceived pros and cons. And this helps us to emphasize the benefits to behavioral changes and together with them brainstorm ways to overcome barriers and decrease difficulties associated with change. The second mediator of change is self-efficacy, and this is a big one. This is the confidence which is required for an individual to engage in a new behavior for health promotion. This is important for both motivation to make a change and actually taking the action. This works in both ways in the sense that self-efficacy is increased when barriers are reduced and having, self, sorry, having self-efficacy helps to a patient to overcome the barriers themselves. So it goes both ways. As they overcome barriers, self-efficacy increases, and as self-efficacy increases, they are able to overcome their barriers. Finding ways that we can reduce the difficulty that's associated with making a behavior change can give us ways to highlight easy ways to implement healthy behavior changes that can be a really effective strategy for our patients. Another way that a patient may build on their self-efficacy is learning through new skills. Learning how to grocery shop on a budget, preparing new healthy foods, or learning a new physical activity, all of these things lead a patient from intention to action as their self-efficacy is built up. 
There are 10 cognitive and behavioral per, uh, processes that focus on an individual's thoughts, feelings, and emotions, which will build on their ability to change and reinforce that behavior. Five of these processes are experiential processes, which are listed here. These are strategies that an individual is going to move, uh, use as they move themselves through the stages of change. Consciousness raising is seeking out new information and increasing their understanding of their condition, looking for new ways to adopt healthier behaviors. For example, I've been reading online about the benefits of adopting a whole food plant-based diet. This is an indication that this patient is actively seeking to inform and educate themselves about making a change. Dramatic relief or an emotional arousal is the expression of negative emotions associated with their need for change. So this is the fear surrounding their condition or any anxiety that they might have about what risks are associated with it, anytime that they're expressing a sense of worry. And this can be a completely normal human reaction to finding out a, a new diagnosis um, and just a general fear for their future health. For example, if I don't quit smoking, I can get emphysema or cancer. I could even die. That's a normal dramatic relief and emotional expression of their potential condition. When an individual reassesses their self-image and their knowledge of their belief about nutrition or their behavior, they're moving through an individualized experiential process of behavior change. For example, this patient may then say, I used to be a runner. I can start running again if I stop smoking. Reevaluating the environmental impact of previous behaviors is a look at how our actions affected our family members, coworkers, and even the physical environment. An individual may perceive the benefit to increasing their own fruit and vegetable intake as an added benefit, it will increase fruit and vegetables for their children. Deciding to cook more often and eat less fast food would also improve their family's dietary habits. Shopping at local farmer's markets is good for the environment and local business. All of these awarenesses can help facilitate the process of change because now there's all these other added benefits to making the change beyond their own health. Self-liberation to making the change may sound like a simple affirmation or commitment to behavior change, something along the lines of, I'm committed to eating a healthy home-cooked meal more often. Each opportunity that a patient takes towards a healthy change is a chance to use conscious decision making. Behavioral processes of change are focused on interventions and reinforcements of new behavioral patterns. Individuals are moving through the behavioral processes of change when they seek help from people that they trust. Enlisting trust and support group, joining an exercise class, making a commitment to coworkers or family members, having a pact to abstain from certain foods that have been contributing to their negative health conditions. All of these ways are building supportive, helping relationships. Counter conditioning is when someone replaces their old behaviors with new healthful ones. So instead of snacking on the uh, fast food that they used to have, they might make an effort to shop for more fruits and vegetables and have them cut up, have a bowl of fruit on the counter instead of grabbing a bag of chips. All of these ways are that they're ways that a patient can really start to change old past patterns and replace them with healthier new ones. Often individuals see certain junk food as a reward and dieting is seen as a punishment. Recognizing these ideas and then reevaluating the perceptions surrounding that can really improve the chances of acting out healthier behaviors. Rewarding oneself with healthier alternatives and seeing physical activity and healthy meals as a positive, happy, enjoyable decision will definitely increase the likelihood of continuing to engage in those behaviors. No one wants to keep dieting if it's a punishment, they want to eat healthy to sustain themselves in a, in a good, healthy, happy, enjoyable manner. Removing cues or triggers for undesirable or unhealthy behaviors is also really helpful. So avoiding walking past a candy store by taking an alternative route can prevent a trigger. 
adding healthy cues provides a positive external stimuli. For instance, they can set a daily reminder on their phone to drink more water throughout the day, or they may even write themselves a note to remind themselves during walk uh, to during lunch to go take a walk. All of these things can really provide cues to healthy actions. Becoming more aware of the external, environmental, and social conditions that influence behavioral patterns can help an individual to recognize areas where change might be facilitated. Shopping at a more expensive grocery store every day out of convenience can cause them to stretch their grocery budget too far, not allowing them the ability to purchase a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables that would last throughout the week, or food in general. In this particular case, it would be important to seek out more affordable options and be able to uh, adopt healthy behaviors easier by not stretching money for uh, gourmet items, instead buying a variety of healthy things for less money. The theory of planned behavior is a useful way to enhance the patient's motivation to make healthy changes. This theory states that individuals will be more likely to engage in new behavior if they expect the action will result in a beneficial outcome. Developing specific plans that can help to translate, uh, translate their desires into actions is a way that we can do this. Even though this is a lot to summarize on one slide, I'm not going to go very far and deep in, into these this model, but I want to give you a little bit of background on the theories of reasoned action and the theories of planned behavior, since these theories have been helping us to understand the relationship between attitudes, intention, and behavior for decades. It's important to address. The theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behavior focus on the individual's motivational factors as the determinants for their likelihood of performing a certain behavior. And using this framework, you can really identify behavioral, normative, and control beliefs that have affected our patients in their decision-making before. When you've mutually assessed the patient's perceived control and what they perceive to be the difficulty or ease of performing a, a, a necessary behavioral change, through that, we can find ways to support them towards making the behavioral intention, and eventually the desired behaviors. So to summarize, um, patients really at, throughout any process when they come in to see you could be at all different unique stages of change according to their perceptions, their attitudes, and a variety of influential constructs. Recognizing where the patient is in their stage of change and in their processes of change can highlight ways for us to support and promote their self-efficacy. So following this module, I'd like you to complete the coordinating reading materials, and then you're going to complete a brief quiz as well as a case study where you're going to assess hypothetical patients in their stage and processes of behavioral change, and then you're going to have the opportunity to utilize those theories in your assignments. So as always, I hope that you reach out if you have any questions regarding this module's content or the assignments. Thank you so much for watching. And here are the references. Thank you.